Welcome back everyone to the deep dive, ready to get into it. Always. Today we're going deep on de-dollarization. Ooh, that's a hot topic. It is. You know, these BRICS nations, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Right. Their goal to challenge the US dollar. You guys sent in a ton of research on the latest BRICS summit. What happened there? Yeah, it's been interesting to see all the speculation if they can really make something to replace the dollar. I mean, that's the big question, right? Huge question. So one thing that jumped out from these articles was Russia's idea for a new reserve currency Yeah. at the summit, and it kind of flopped. It did. The funny thing is even the name R5 caused problems. Really? It seems small, but it shows yeah. you there are big divisions within BRICS. Okay, so tell me more. Why was R5 such a big deal? Well, each original BRICS member has a currency starting with R, right? The ruble, real, rupee, renminbi, and rand. Exactly. Ruble, real, rupee, renminbi, and rand. So on the surface, R5 made sense, but other members felt it was too Russia-focused. Like Russia was trying to take control. Exactly. It showed everyone that there's a power struggle happening behind the scenes. So not off to a great start. Can't even agree on a name. What was Russia even thinking this thing would look like? They proposed a digital currency, like those central bank digital currencies everyone's talking about these days, backed by the treasuries of the member nations. Oh, interesting. They even compared it to Germany's Rentenmark from the 1920s, you know? To fight hyperinflation. Yeah. Back then it was backed by land and industrial assets, but still a bold comparison. Bold for sure. No. So how would the shares in this R5 have been split? Based on GDP. So China would have had 40%. Wow. With Brazil, India, and Russia each getting 10%. Hmm. Given the you know current geopolitical situation, people were pretty skeptical, <laughs> especially about Russia's intentions. Understandably. So R5 is dead in the water, but what about using the Chinese yuan to replace the dollar? Some articles mention that as a possibility. Oh, there's definitely talk about it. Some folks think China's pushing for it quietly, but... The yuan has its own challenges to become a global reserve currency. What kinds of challenges? Well, full convertibility is a big one. China has capital controls limiting how much yuan can move in and out of the country. So to make the yuan a true global currency, they'd have to loosen those controls. Exactly. And that could have huge consequences for China's own economy. OK, help me understand this convertibility thing a bit better. Right. What would that look like in practice? Right now, it's tough to freely exchange yuan for other currencies like dollars or euros. Right. There are restrictions. Full convertibility would remove those so you could exchange without limits. Got it. So why would that be a problem for China? Wouldn't they want their currency to be in high demand? It's not that straightforward. If everyone wanted yuan, it could appreciate rapidly. A strong yuan. Exactly. A stronger yuan means Chinese exports get more expensive, potentially hurting their competitiveness. Ah, that makes sense. China's economy relies heavily on exports. And there's another interesting wrinkle. Even if other countries held more yuan, they might just invest those yuan in, say, U.S. dollar assets. So they'd be trying to move away from the dollar, but end up supporting it anyway. That's pretty ironic. It shows how entrenched the dollar is. This brings us to another layer of complexity, the expansion of BRICS. Right. They just added new members. Saudi Arabia, Egypt, the UAE, Iran, and Ethiopia. Wow. A diverse group, for sure. This makes decision-making even harder. How do you get consensus with so many different interests and ideologies? It seems almost impossible. There's a real risk that BRICS could just become another talking shop, like the G77. Lots of talk, no action. Exactly. Plus, there are already tensions within BRICS, India, and China's border dispute, Russia being isolated on the world stage, the new members bring their own baggage. So even before taking on the dollar, they have a lot to sort out internally. A lot. It highlights a key point. Challenging the dollar isn't just about making a new currency or having summits. What is it about then? It's about trust, stability, the rule of law, all those things. They took centuries to develop in the US and that's how the dollar rose organically. You can't just force that to happen overnight, especially not from the top down like BRICS is trying. Yeah, trust and stability are earned. So you're saying that before even thinking about replacing the dollar, BRICS, especially China, need to get their own houses in order. That's one of the big takeaways here, yeah. Focusing on internal economic and political reforms might be more important than trying to dismantle the existing system. Like what kind of reforms? What would that look like? For China, it's about building a strong domestic market. 
boosting innovation, tackling corruption, improving legal protections. These are the foundations for sustainable growth. Shifting the focus from global competition to domestic strength. Exactly. It's about saying, hey, before trying to change the world, make sure your own house is in order. It highlights a contrast between the U.S. focus on domestic consumption and innovation and China's reliance on exports and government control. Two different philosophies of economic development playing out. De-dollarization is about more than just currencies. It's about which model will shape the future. That's it. It's why we need to look beyond the headlines and understand these internal reforms. This is it getting really interesting? I want to hear more about those reforms and what they mean globally. But we're out of time for now. Yeah, we'll have to pick this up again. We'll be back soon to continue our deep dive. Stay tuned. So those internal reforms we touched on, I'm really curious to see how those could actually play out in a place like China. You know, we talked about a robust domestic market, but what does that even mean on the ground? Yeah, I'm with you on that. Boosting domestic consumption, relying less on exports. It sounds good. But how do you make that happen? It's a tough one, for sure. It's a multifaceted approach, right? For China, it would mean creating a real culture of innovation, like encouraging people to take risks, create new products and services, not just for export, for Chinese people to use, too. So, like, building a Silicon Valley, but inside China? Exactly. And then you need stronger legal protections for businesses, for investors, so they feel confident, you know, operating in China investing there. Makes sense. So it's about creating an environment where people feel safe participating in the economy, not just following orders from the government. Right. And we can't forget about corruption. That eats away at trust. It stifles growth. Big hurdle to overcome. Sounds like a huge undertaking, especially with all the entrenched interests and bureaucracy in China. It's a big challenge, no doubt. But if they really want sustainable growth, if they want to be a global leader in the 21st century, it's essential. It makes you wonder if these internal challenges are even bigger than the external ones, you know, like trying to replace the U.S. dollar. That's the question, isn't it? Are they so focused on toppling the dollar that they're missing the foundations of their own economic strength? Hmm. Definitely food for thought. Let's zoom out for a sec, though. What does all this mean for the average person trying to understand global finance? I think it just shows how complicated and interconnected everything is. De-dollarization, if it even happens, it won't be a quick change. The dollar's dominance took decades to build. It's woven into the global financial system. Disrupting that will have ripple effects everywhere. It's not like flipping a switch. There will be a lot of uncertainty, a lot of adjustments. Absolutely. And those ripple effects, they could be good or bad. Depends on how it all unfolds. There's the potential for more economic and political multipolarity. So more balance. Power isn't just concentrated in a few countries. Right. But there's also the risk of instability. Change can be disruptive. No guarantee a new system will be better. A bit of a gamble, then. Kind of like stepping off a familiar path into uncharted territory. You don't know what's ahead. Makes these conversations even more important. Go beyond the hype and really try to understand things. 100%. Move past those simple narratives, the fear mongering, and really think critically about things. So we've talked about the challenges, the divisions within BRICS, the dollar's power, the potential for instability. Are there any positives? Anything giving you hope for a smoother transition? Honestly, what gives me hope is just the awareness that's growing around these issues. More people are having these thoughtful conversations about global finance. They're asking tough questions. They're demanding more from their leaders. So people are realizing the old ways might not be working anymore. Yeah. And that's where those internal reforms become crucial. It's not just about one country's economy. It's about building trust, showing a commitment to responsible governance. So if a BRICS nation can prove they are committed to transparency, to stability, to the rule of law, that would help build confidence in a new system, right? Absolutely. It's about proving they can be reliable partners, not just competitors. They're not trying to destroy, but to build something better. It's about earning that trust and credibility, which, like we said, is what has made the dollar so strong for so long. Exactly. And that takes time, effort, a real commitment to change. It won't happen overnight. There will be bumps in the road. But the payoff could be huge. Okay, so as we wrap up part two of this deep dive, mm -hmm. what's the main thing you want listeners to remember? I'd say this. The future of global finance, it's not set in stone. We're all shaping it through our choices, our actions, how we engage with these issues. So it's not a done deal. It's not inevitable. No, we have agency. I like that. So we talked about the challenges, the divisions within BRICS, how strong the dollar is, all the potential for things to go wrong. 
Any bright spots, though? Yeah. Anything that makes you think this could actually go smoothly? You know, the increasing awareness is encouraging. People are having these conversations about global finance. They're asking the tough questions. They want more transparency, more accountability from leaders. Yeah, it does seem like there's this growing sense that the old ways aren't cutting it anymore. Totally. And this is where those internal reforms become so important. It's not just about economics. It's about showing you can be trusted, that you govern responsibly. So if a BRICS nation can show the world, hey, we're transparent, we're stable, we follow the rule of law, that could help people trust a new system. Exactly. It's about being a reliable partner, not just a competitor. Showing that you're not just tearing things down, but building something better. Earning that trust, that credibility, like we said, that's what made the dollar so strong in the first place. Right. And that doesn't happen overnight. It takes time, effort, commitment. There will be setbacks, but the potential rewards are huge. Okay, so as we wrap up this deep dive into de-dollarization, what's the one thing you want our listeners to walk away with? Thanks. The future of global finance, it's not predetermined. It's something we're all shaping through our choices, our actions, how we engage with these issues. Wow, so we're not just along for the ride. We're actually part of writing the story. We are. Stay informed, stay engaged, and keep asking those tough questions. Great advice. And on that note, we'll leave you with this thought. <laughs> If a new global reserve currency does emerge, what values will it represent? Will it be based on cooperation, sustainability, shared prosperity? Or will it just be the same power dynamics all over again? Something to think about. Thanks for joining us on The Deep Dive.